So the French Revolution we know starts in 1789, and we know that it's based largely on the sort of bankruptcy of France, right? So we know that the French government is in complete bankruptcy as a result of a lot of things, right? Stretching back to the 1760s and the loss during the Seven Years' War, the assistance to the American War of Independence and the inability of the American government to pay that back. But it's also part of this sort of really archaic uh, ancien regime where uh, you have the first and the second estate, right? The nobility and the clergy who don't really pay much tax at all. And the third estate who is really bearing the burden of this, right? But what's interesting there is that the tax is not really equal based on for, for everybody, right? Uh, France is really just sort of this hodgepodge of different overlapping circles, right? So it's a Catholic dominated church, uh, country with the Roman Catholic Church. So if you live in a diocese, which is sort of the geographic territory of the Catholic Church, but it does not overlap perfectly with the town in which you live, you may be taxed at a different rate than somebody who lives in a different area. So it just creates a really archaic system where there's a lot of different variables to taxation, and it creates a situation that people are extremely disgruntled with. France is also really hurt uh, by two bad harvests in the late 1780s, which again, adds sort of insult to injury. All of this is in the backdrop of the Enlightenment, right? The Enlightenment era is sort of coursing its way through all of this, and you have young, wealthy merchants who are very wealthy and, and earning a lot of money, but they are just not able to become as wealthy as or get the privileges of the upper two estates. And that's really sort of troubling to them because in a lot of ways, they could be wealthier than their counterparts. But because of how they are born, they don't see those benefits. So that's what really brings the French Revolution uh, to, to begin. The other piece to that, and I'm going to pull up a map here, right? The other piece to that is that we need to remember that not all of France is experiencing this in the same way, right? So when the Estates General is called on May 5th, 1789, and those delegates come to Versailles, right? I mean, the process that begins uh, is not equal, right? So by, you know, let's say se late 1789, you know, there's a, a revolution that breaks out here in, in the area called the Vendée. Now, the Vendée was a very heavily Catholic, devoutly Catholic territory. So the changes that are brought about by the, uh, among the, on the Catholic Church by 1790 are really going to hurt the people here in the Vendée. And what happens is there's a small revolution that ultimately gets crushed. So when we get to the reign of terror in 1793-4, a lot of the people who are going to die are coming from the Vendée. But it's really in Paris where the revolution is taking on so much authority. Uh, and it's there that, uh, you know, the government is based, the Committee of Public Safety that is formed, uh, it will be based. Now, as the Estates General turns into the National Assembly in January, of, uh, sorry, in June of 1789, and we have the, the publication of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizen, right? The government needs to fund, uh, fund this revolution. So land is taken from the Catholic Church. It is sold to buoy up the economy. Uh, and the, the, the money that's created is called the, an asanya, um, which is just a complete failure as, as a money system. So there are political parties that ultimately form, right? Uh, there's the, the Jacobins and the Girondins. Both are sort of left-wing radical parties. Uh, Maximilien Robespierre, right, the person who will ultimately lead the reign of terror, you know, is kind of going crazy. He has a mental breakdown, certainly, uh, after a few assassination attempts on his life. Um, but... The, there's another opposing group uh, led by Jean-Paul Marat, the Girondins, 
Jean-Paul Marat was a disaffected uh, journalist who had a publication called The Friend of the People. And he is, uh, you know, he is sort of rallying support for the revolutionary cause. Um, and, you know, he gets a lot of enemies. He's ultimately assassinated uh, while he's in his bathtub. So he's, you know, by actually a young, uh, young girl in her teens. Um, so you can see that there's just a lot of sort of craziness going on. Robespierre is ultimately uh, himself guillotined in the summer in July of 1794. And this really impacts what goes on moving forward, right? As the, you know, when the when Robespierre is killed and sort of all of the craziness that had gone on in the first and second phases of the of the French Revolution, people start looking for some stability. So in 1795, there is a new constitution that is issued called the director and, and the executive branch here is the directory. It's a five person executive branch. And in that five person executive branch, uh, one person every year has their name drawn from a hat they are removed, but they are also not eligible from the directory. They're replaced and they're not eligible for election again for another year. Right. So it ensures that no one gets too much power. The problem here is this is ineffective. People move communication lines are, are slow. Um, and, you know, factions form. In all of this, right, Napoleon Bonaparte's star is rising. Napoleon has had a lot of successful military campaigns. There's also a power vacuum as nobility have fled to Austria, Germany, Spain, Britain, the United States of America. They are uh, Napoleon has the ability to show his prestige and he winds up getting a lot of success in um, in, in military, but then he, when he comes home, the, the minister Talleyrand helps him become a dictator. Uh, he winds up taking over, uh, has a, the coup of Brumaire, uh, which is November 1799. He takes over the directory. He gets another constitution put in where he gets declared the consul. Uh, and then in 1801, he becomes consul for life. So I think at the end of 1799, we're really looking at what will ultimately become the end of the French Revolution. Uh, some people say 1795. I think 1799 is a good place to end it as well.